Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with some more uh, Ottoman history. We're, on, the, we're doing the Ottoman Wars, uh, Skander, Skander Bag, and Albanian Rebellion. Okay, because we got a rebellion going on. Okay, this will be interesting. Uh, pretty much we had, like, the Ottomans. Man, I've, names Moldovia. Is that it? Uh... We went in there and had a couple of cool battles. Well, one, one really good battle, amazing battle. Oh, man, what's that guy's name, man? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, guys. I don't. I mean, you guys, if you guys have watched the previous episode, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, amazing strategy, uh, awesome battle, and all that good stuff. And yeah, fought and destroyed the Ottomans, and then uh, the Ottomans came back and re redeemed themselves. They just had the numbers, and they just overpowered them. So I feel like, and then they had a retreat, right? They kind of left, but uh, um, the Moldovians or whatever, the outsiders there, they had to kind of pay tribute, I think, I believe if I remember correctly. And so now we're kind of at square one. Uh, so yeah, everything's kind of like, there's nothing, everything kind of reset and there's not, we're not in the middle of something. It's kind of, you know, we're the start of something else, I guess. Uh, so I guess we're, a rebellion's going to come up, obviously. That's the name of the episode. But we're going to jump into this, and yeah, let's just let's do this. Let's say we grab my drink. All right, guys. You guys ready? I am ready. Interesting stuff right here. Please hit that like and subscribe button. I'd appreciate it. Please and thank you. Right. Kings in general is awesome. Previously, we have covered a number of battles fought by the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans. Yet events that happened in Albania were omitted, as we decided to talk about them in a separate video. The leader of the resistance against the Ottoman expansion separate that happened in Albania were omitted, as we decided to talk about them in a separate video. The leader of the resistance. Okay, so we're not. We're basically not really covering the Ottomans right now. They want to kind of show us what's going on in the midst of this, you know, in Albania. Okay, so okay. Kind of understand. <laughs> we decided to talk about them in a separate video. The leader of the resistance against the Ottoman expansion in this region was a legendary commander, George Castriotti Skanderbeg. His deeds would exalt him to the level of the likes of Stefan the Great, John Hunyadi, and Stefan Lazarevich. George was born in. Stefan, is that the guy that did the amazing battle? I, was, I think his name was Stefan. I don't know. Anyways. George was born in 1405 to a formidable Albanian lord, John Castriotti. In 1415, he was sent as a hostage to the Ottoman court and started receiving military education at Enderun. Not much is known about this period in his life, but apparently he quickly moved through the ranks and the Sultan even granted... He was a hostage, but they trained him as a hostage? Uh... I guess, you know, the Ottomans kind of take him so, you know, th his dad doesn't do, it, do anything funny because if his dad starts anything funny, any funny business, they're going to kill the son. And, but, you know, I guess, and partly in exchange, you know, so this father doesn't do anything, they're going to train the son pretty much. It, it just it seems kind of weird. His life, but apparently he quickly moved through the ranks, and the Sultan even granted him fiefs in Macedonia and Bulgaria. That is when he probably gained the nickname Skanderbeg, which can be translated as Lord Alexander from Turkish. Wow. John Castriotti rebelled against Ottoman rule twice between 1428 and 1436, and most of his lands were annexed. Yet his son did not join this cause and continued serving the Ottomans until 1443. I mean, I don't know how old the son was when he got taken hostage, 
But if it was at a pretty young age, I guess it's kind of one of those things. Uh, I forget what that term is. You know, when you, it's like when you get kidnapped, you end up like falling for your your captor because I don't know. Actually, that's not what I'm kind of going for. But uh, you know, you're around these people for you. You know, if you're if you're taken at five years old and then you're raised until I just say until you're like at least like 15 years old. You're really, that's the only people you've really grown to know. So that's the people you kind of care about and love. So you probably know his, his kind of Ottoman family more than he knows his own father kind of thing. And let, it just depends how old he was, I guess, when he was taken hostage. I don't know. You guys get what I'm saying, right? So, you know, he feels like he has a purpose for the Ottomans and he doesn't really know much about his history or his home with his dad or whatnot. I don't know. So it makes sense that he's with the Ottomans, you know, if that's the case. That's probably piss though. Joined this cause and continued serving the Ottomans until 1443. Skanderbeg and his 300 men would desert the Ottomans either prior to or during the Battle of Nis, where Władysław III defeated the forces of the Sultan. Okay, so he he, he he went back. You know, he probably had a change of heart, and maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe it was just talking to some people around and you know, he just kind of had a change of heart and said, nah, I need, I need to go back to my roots, right? Okay. Cool business. Sorry, I keep pausing it, you know. If I talk about it, I'm more likely to remember. The Bnis, where Władysław III defeated the forces of the Sultan. Providing the governor of Kruja with a fake letter from Murad, Skanderbeg took over the city. On March 2nd, 1444, he managed to unite the local Albanian and Serbian lords in the League of Leisure, thus forming a strong alliance against his former masters. Meanwhile, a power struggle between Murad II and Mehmed II created a power vacuum in the Ottoman Empire. And although Murad managed to defeat the Crusaders led by Vadisfav and John Hunyadi at Varna in 1444, right. the situation in Albania remained precarious. In June of the same year, Murad sent one of his best commanders, Ali Pasha, along with 30,000 troops to crush the Albanian rebellion. Skanderbeg moved to a field called hmm. Torviol to block the Ottomans. The Albanians had a total of 15,000 men, 8,000 cavalry and 7,000 okay, infantry okay. facing the Ottoman army. Skanderbeg had picked the battlefield. Okay, I was wrong at being this episode. I kind of thought we were kind of doing just like an episode that didn't really have anything to do with the Ottomans, but never mind. I was wrong. It's just the Albanians are rebelling against, rebelling against the Ottomans. Never mind. Sorry. Infantry facing the Ottoman army. Skanderbeg had picked the battlefield beforehand and ensured his troops were paid and religious services were taken care of. Realizing his numerical disadvantage, he decided to use hit-and-run tactics and ambushes to make up for this. During the night of the 28th of June, his soldiers were resting, whereas Ottoman troops were celebrating, sure of a victory the next day. The battlefield was ideal for a defender with inferior numbers. It was only four kilometers wide, and a large army would have difficulty creating definitive battle formations. Like, I don't know, like, you think, like, the Ottomans, like, the commanders over here, like, why are you guys celebrating, man? You got a big battle the next day, like, I don't know if they're drinking or not, but it, it doesn't seem like a wise move to let your, I don't know, don't count your chickens before they hatch, right? It, like, it just smells like underdog win all over it. Obviously, scanner bags, he's going he's gonna to win this battle, just obviously. The next morning, June 29th, 1444, Skanderbeg utilized an old but still relevant crescent formation, which he learned during his days as an Ottoman captain, with infantry on his flanks and footmen and archers in the center. He also hid at least 6,000 horsemen, divided into two groups, on the extreme left and right. Seeing that the Albanian infantry was not supported by cavalry, the- Yeah, that should have been like their first giveaway of, like, they have no cavalry. Like, the Ottomans should have been like, something's amiss here. But then again, they were celebrating beforehand, so they probably were just overconfident and weren't really thinking, and they weren't thinking in general, apparently. 
And yeah, obviously these uh, cavalry is gonna, you know, is gonna end up flanking them. Like I, I'm guessing, like the, the cal their cal army's cavalry is gonna come and, and since it's so narrow, uh, scanner base man are gonna kind of fight them off, and then you're gonna have the main army come down here, you know, mm -hmm. and then the cavalry is gonna come on both sides or surround them, and then bam, that's it, right? <laughs> The Ottoman horsemen attack Skanderbeg's center. However, the Albanian footmen stood strong and managed to repulse right. the enemy cavalry. Now here comes the red. Skanderbeg knew that the Ottomans often used feigned retreats to dislodge their enemies, so he stopped his troops from chasing them. Seeing that, the whole Ottoman army attacked the Albanians and engaged along the whole line. As the valley was narrow, less than half of the Ottoman troops participated in the battle, the rest forming up into a second and third line. At Skanderbeg's signal, his hidden cavalry attacked from nice. the right. However, Ali Pasha managed to turn part of his third line to nullify this threat. Yeah. Skanderbeg then ordered his hidden force on the left to charge into the rear of the forces engaged with the Albanian nice. right. This attack crushed the third line of the Ottomans and freed up all of the Albanian cavalry. I, I always go for the underdog, unless I'm following like a, a specific individual. I always go for the underdog, so I, like I have no stake in it. Who like I don't root for the Ottomans. I don't root for the other guys. I mean, I'm following the Ottomans, but I'm not following a singular person. But these battles, you know, it's kind of cool to see the tactics of the underdog kind of thing. So that's cool. And they did it exactly how I thought they were going to do it. Nice. Crushed the third line of the Ottomans and freed up all of the Albanian cavalry, which turned and charged the rest of the Ottomans from the rear. The Ottomans were now surrounded and according wow. to various sources, lost anywhere from 10 to 20,000 in this massacre. Yeah, just look at that, man. Look at, like, what? I don't know how many troops this is, but, like, they got, like, you know, four rectangles, or I guess five, and they got, like, pretty much almost all their guys still left alive, man. It just shows you, man, like, numbers don't aren't everything. If you have the right grounds and you're actually putting some thought into it, like I said, like, you got a shot, you know? Like, good job, man. Skater bag, you know, legend after this, right? The sources lost anywhere from 10 to 20,000 in this massacre, while Skanderbeg's casualties were below 5,000. Nice. The Good defeat job. at Torviol was a massive blow to the Ottomans, yet they were not going to leave the rebellious region in peace. He's not. Following the victory, Skanderbeg retreated to the city of Kruja. The Ottomans were still focused on Hungary and John Hunyadi, so the three armies sent to Albania between 1445 and... I don't mean... I don't, I'm sorry if I'm wrong here, but, like, Alba so far, like, through all these Ottoman wars, Albania's been... It's like a small country, right? You know, compared to, you know, Moldovia and Hungary and stuff like that. Yet, you know, the Ottomans have just left them alone. You know, I, I figured that small small country would have been, like, engulfed by the Ottomans and it would have fell, but they've held their own, you know, so I mean, Albanians are pretty pretty tough, man, like, because they're small they get way outnumbered, you know, they don't have the land but obviously there's a reason the Ottomans haven't taken that piece of land yet, so that's pretty cool Hunyadi. So the three armies sent to Albania between 1445 and 1448 were relatively small Skanderbeg defeated them using hit-and-run tactics. Right. In the spring of 1448, uh -oh. Sultan Murad moved against Skanderbeg himself with an go. army of at least 50,000. Big dogs. Although the Albanians employed scorched-earth tactics and continually attacked the Ottomans, Murad managed to besiege the important fortress of Svetigrad in May. Skanderbeg attacked the Ottoman camp, but wasn't able to do much against the overwhelming Ottoman numbers. In July, Svetigrad's garrison surrendered. Fortunately for Skanderbeg, Hunyadi crossed into Ottoman territory, and that forced Murad to move against him. Wow. Hungarian and Ottoman forces would engage in October at the Second Battle of Kosovo. 
Some sources claim that Skanderbeg attempted to help Hunyadi, but wasn't allowed to pass through the territory held by the Serbian prince, Juraj Brankovic. Regardless, the Ottomans won and were able to turn their attention to the Albanians yet again. In 1449, their forces took over the fortress of Berat. A year later, Murad arrived in Albania and besieged Kruja. Skanderbeg had opted to take the bulk of his forces outside the walls of the city, and appointed Rana Conti as the commander of the garrison. His plan was to attack the massive Ottoman army, numbering up to 100,000 from outside the walls. He employed this tactic. Whenever the Ottomans would get close to breaking in, he would divert their attention by attacking their rear. For nearly five months, from May to November, the Ottomans tried to break through the fortifications, even using cannons, but eventually this failed. Trying to bribe the commandant did not work. Realizing numbers would not bring victory and that winter was arriving, Murad decided to lift the siege and return to Iderna, where he would die and the throne would pass on to Mehmed II. Oh, okay. Constantinople was the priority for Mehmed, so he sent other commanders to attack Skanderbeg in his stead, but they were defeated in 1452 at Modric and Mechad. It was obvious that the Albanian problem was not going away easily. In the meantime, Skanderbeg recognized the suzerainty of the King of Naples and Aragon Alfonso, thus gaining more funds and men. In 1455, Skanderbeg attempted to take Berat from the Ottomans and besieged the city. Believing that the small Ottoman garrison would be defeated soon, Skanderbeg decided to leave his forces under the command of his subordinates. This was a mistake. Oh. For one, Skanderbeg's commanders did not have his experience fighting in the Ottoman army. Also, a 20,000 strong Ottoman... That's right, I, I thought I forgot for a second that Skanderbeg was raised by the Ottomans, so he knows all their tricks and, you know, what it's going to take to beat them and you know just the kind of uh, political you know part of it you know but anyways yeah mistake when reinforcement army arrived under the command of evrenos isa bay even though skanderbeg rushed back to the city and repulsed really? evrenos's troops his army neither had the capacity nor the morale to continue the siege and had to retreat Although not a decisive victory, the Ottomans saw the win at Berat as a sign that the war could be turned in their favour. After the death of Hunyadi in 1456, the Ottomans gained a respite on the Hungarian front. It became clear that the showdown between the Ottomans and Skanderbeg was fast approaching. Uh -oh. The Ottomans mustered around 65,000 troops under Evranos to crush the League of Leisure once and for all. As for the Albanian side, Skanderbeg had to deal with a perpetual problem that always bothered him, relatives and allies turning against him. It should be noted that the Ottomans, Venetians, rival Albanian nobles and even the royalty of Aragon tried to manipulate Skanderbeg. Nevertheless, the prudent Albanian ruler managed to form a 10,000-strong army and prepared for battle against Evrenos. After centuries of mobile warfare, the Ottomans needed formations. Archers in the rear, cavalry on the flanks, and infantry providing the bulk at the center. That's like 60,000 to 10,000 now, so you have 6 to 1 odds. So yeah, you gotta be, be picking the battlegrounds for sure. And yeah, you gotta have some tricks up your sleeve because, yeah, that, that's some crazy odds. Archers in the rear, cavalry on the flanks, and infantry providing the bulk at the center. So when Skanderbeg and his experienced men stormed the Ottoman camp near Albulena on September 2nd, 1457, there was nothing the Ottomans could do despite their numbers. More than 20,000 Ottoman troops were killed, and their invasion failed. 
Wow. Alvilena became the greatest victory of the Albanian resistance against the Ottomans. Between 1460 and 1462, yeah. Skanderbeg helped his suzerain Ferdinand of Naples in Italy, both as a commander and a diplomat. A new Ottoman incursion forced him to return to the Balkans. In July of 1462, he defeated another army sent against him at Mokra. In August, Skanderbeg and this is great. I mean, Skanderbeg, as long as he's as long as Skanderbeg is basically a part of the battle, he's going to win. He just knows he's just too smart and knows his enemy too well, and uh, yeah, it's like he just like he because he, he can't just leave. You know, it's kind of like. Hannibal and Caesar, you know, do those videos. If they leave their second in command, they're going to end up losing. If Caesar is not part of the battle, you know, his guy ends up losing. So, yeah, he's definitely a top dog. Like, you know. Entered Macedonia and defeated three Ottoman armies in quick succession. Wow. This forced the Ottoman Sultan to sign a peace deal in 1463. Nice. Yet, when later that year, the Pope, Pius II, called for a crusade, Skanderbeg broke the peace, entered Ottoman territory in Macedonia, and pillaged it. However... I mean, I get, did he have to join the crusade? I mean, yeah, maybe there was some kind of deal between the two, like, you know, but... Hmm, interesting there. ...entered Ottoman territory in Macedonia, and pillaged it. However, Pius passed away before anyone else joined the crusade, so Skanderbeg was left to fight alone with minimal Venetian assistance. Wow. That's... Still, in September, Skanderbeg and his 10,000 approached the Ottoman stronghold in the... See, like, he broke the peace for nothing. Like, he, if he, he could have just wed us. I guess he was looking for a fight then. He should have just waited for all these allies to come because you waited. Ottomans would have, you know, then the guy would have died, the crusade would have been over, and the Ottomans wouldn't even know anything was even up. And then they'd still have their peace, and everything would still be hunky-dory. But no, it's just one of those bad timing kind of deals. In September, Skanderbeg and his 10,000 approached the Ottoman stronghold in the area, the city of Orid, which was defended by 15,000 under Sheremet Bey. Skanderbeg did not have enough troops to assault the fortifications, so he sent a small 500-strong detachment to lure the Ottomans out. This plan worked perfectly. The Ottoman forces rode right into the Albanian ambush and were slaughtered. More than 10,000 Ottomans were killed. Despite that, the remainder of the Ottoman army managed to escape and then defended Orid against Skanderbeg. Seeing that no Crusader support was arriving, Mehmet sent another army, commanded by Balaban, against Skanderbeg in 1465, but the Albanian leader was able to defeat his opponent yet again. My god. That was the last straw that forced Mehmet to muster an army that had between 50 and 100,000 troops and march against Skanderbeg in May of 1466. Wow. Skanderbeg had less than 20,000 troops, and despite his pleas, he received no assistance from Naples or Venice. Despite heavy Albanian resistance, Mehmet besieged Kruja. Still, the fortress held on under heavy Ottoman cannon fire, and Mehmet decided to retreat after pillaging the rest of the country and setting up an Ottoman administration in the eastern part. Oh. He also ordered the construction of many fortresses, thus limiting Skanderbeg's ability to continue his resistance. Kruja was besieged again in 1467, <coughs> but the results were similar. In the beginning of 1468, Skanderbeg died of malaria. The Venetians took over the defense of Albania and continued resisting for a decade. Kruja would fall to Mehmed in 1478, which finally ended the three-decade-long Ottoman-Albanian War. Still, Skanderbeg left his mark on the history of the region and was declared the Champion of Christ, entering an elite company. Wow. Thank you for watching another episode in our series on the Ottoman Wars. 
champion of Christ. Like, the, it sounds like you don't get really much higher than that. It seems like you got to be at least one of the, or the top honor. And I guess, you know, if you're Albanian or, you know, you're from there or live there, I'm assuming this guy is like a hero to you guys. Like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he's on your money or there's statues of him around there, you know. Yeah, like the guy won countless battles just in this one episode. It just seems like he was fighting off the Ottomans at every turn, you know. So as soon as he died, I'm like, well, there goes that, you know, because that's usually how it goes, you know. So, uh, so it'd be kind of cool if, if any, I don't know if anyone watched this here from Albania. I think, I think I think I might have a couple of people for Albanian that watch this. Maybe you guys can let me know like how much of a hero he is for you guys, because I'm assuming he'd be a pretty big hero for you guys. And you know, but you, you just never know. You, you know, there might be something I don't know about him, or they're not. He's not that big of a hero nowadays. I don't know. But anyways, uh, that was pretty cool because, like I said, on the map, this is a very small. I mean, I guess they're still not like, they're not what they used to be. I mean, the Ottomans kind of, kind of have taken that over that area, but, you know, they held on for so long. They're so, they're so they got a small country, it seemed like, and they held off and did a great job. And it seemed like the whole crusade thing, like, if that doesn't happen, like, none of this happens right here. You know, the Ottomans don't continue to attack and don't continue all that. So, once again, the crusades, like, did anything ever good come out of the Crusades for, like, the people, you know, from, like, the Crusaders' countries? Because it just seems like disaster at every turn for the Crusaders. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the Crusades definitely were not a successful kind of thing. Uh, at least, you know, that, I, mean, I know there's different kind of Crusades and, you know, for different, you know, for, I guess, different countries and different religions, but the kind of christian crusades doesn't you know there's not much really to you know to brag about but anyways guys please hit that like and subscribe button below let me know your thoughts below too thought this was a pretty cool episode uh yeah there wasn't like it was just a rebellion that you know the ottomans kind of had to like fight deal with that the albanian problem before they could really i guess focus on the rest you know of the countries they want to go for you know but anyways, guys, yeah, hit the like and subscribe, and I'm going to zoom down here for a second. So what's the next one? Yeah. I'm War, Wars Battles of uh, Toronto, 1480, and Ch I don't know, Children. Uh, so we're kind of jumping a few years, which I, I guess is normal. Uh, but anyways, guys, yeah, hit the like and subscribe. Uh, all, yeah, all the good stuff. Peace. Catch you guys in future videos. Another awesome video. Thank you guys for watching. Have a great night, great day, and I'm out. Peace.